Hi, good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Harvard Club of the United Kingdom, welcome to tonight's presentation by Professor Jason Leach. I'm Victoria Leung, member of the board and events chair of the Harvard Club. Our club is an umbrella organization with college graduates and alumni from all the Harvard graduate schools as well as the college. This event is a collaboration with the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Shared Interest Group in Healthcare. It's one of the many um, if pandemic related Zoom events that we've done over the past couple of years, and they've proved to be very popular. We're very lucky tonight to have um, Professor Leach. So special thanks to Dr. Stefan Serban for making all this possible. Um, Stefan is um, the lead, the, the um, head of our shared interest group in healthcare. And thank you as well to David Rogers and Maria Boudreau from the School of Public Health for facilitating the technical side. And after the presentation, Professor Leach will answer some of your questions. Please um, post your questions by using the chat feature. Now I'm going to pass it over to Stefan. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Stefan Serban. I'm the Specialist Registrar in Dental Public Health at NHS England, and I serve as the Chair of the Shared Interest Group in Healthcare of Harvard Club UK. It is a great privilege to introduce to you today our distinguished speaker, Professor Jason Leach. Jason is the National Clinical Director of Healthcare Quality and Improvement and Senior Clinical Advisor to the Scottish Government. He provided key leadership throughout the response to the COVID pandemic and has been praised for his ability to translate complex scientific information to the public, providing calm and clear advice. From 2005 to 2006, he was Quality Improvement Fellow at the Institute of Healthcare Improvement in Boston, sponsored by the Health Foundation. He qualified as a dentist in 1991 and was a consultant oral surgeon in Glasgow. Jason has a doctorate from the University of Glasgow, a master's in public health from Harvard THN School of Public Health, and is a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, and the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. Without further ado, Professor Jason Leach. Stefan, thank you so much, and hello, everybody. I, I can't believe people have given up any of the day to, to listen to this, but here we are. And uh, I'll do my best to, to make it worth your while. I wonder if, if people are on the Zoom chat and not boiling their kettle or uh, making coffee, you could type in where you are. It would, just, it would just help me understand where the crowd is from. So is there anybody from Scotland? Are there some from Belgium? Are there... So I wonder if you, could, if you could type into the chat. Can I? I? I'm not sure if I can see the chat. Can I? Uh, oh, there we are. Yes, I can see, I can see some. So there's uh, Boston, Vermont, oh, Vermont. I could tell you some stories of my, my time there. There's uh, a Senegalese friend, Oregon. I'm coming from my summer holidays. Whoever that is in Oregon, I, I expect to be entertained. I'm coming to the World Athletics Championships if COVID stays away. We really are quite international. There's a Dane, or there's certainly somebody in Copenhagen. Uh, and then there's somebody in the sunshine in southern Florida. Uh, oh, there's even a Welshman. Oh, for heaven's sake! Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd better turn turn. Uh, I better get the proper slides on. And uh, Myanmar. It's really a very international group. So that that's really helpful because it helps me it helps me understand where people are from. I see some some people from Africa, some people from all over the world. I, I imagine you all have some kind of connection to to Harvard, but also Harvard UK. But I, uh, one of the outcomes of, of this event is I should understand better with David and Marianne and others what the Harvard Club UK is, and I should engage more. So having, having asked me to be your speaker, you may not uh, unfortunately get rid of me. So, so I'm, I'm Professor Jason Leach. I'm the clinical director of the health system here in Scotland. That, that makes me one of the three senior clinical advisors to our first minister. So we have a chief medical officer, a chief nurse, and a national clinical director. And in peacetime, pre-COVID, I was the kind of operational guy. I was the guy who looked after all the diseases that could kill you, the operational waiting times, the all of those things you would be used to. And then in the pandemic, I ended up as the principal clinical public face of the pandemic in Scotland. I'm sure each of your countries wherever you are, had an individual like me. Our First Minister chose quite early on not to do this by herself. Whether you like our politics or not, it became very clear that when we were doing daily press conferences to Scotland, 
we needed a clinical voice. And we shared that a little bit. So we had a chief medical, we've had two chief medical officers during the pandemic. We've had three chief nurses, but the first minister and I are the only two in the same jobs we started off in. And uh, that's maybe quite unusual in the two years of, of the pandemic. So thank you for having me. It's a real privilege to speak to you. I have quite a nice evening. I have Harvard here. And then after you, I'm going to give out some awards to Scotland's young people. So I apologize that I have to finish sharp at seven o'clock to go speak to Scotland's young people at the first live award ceremony for some time for some of the heroic work they've done in the pandemic. So I'm going to share some slides. And uh, please, if you have questions, observations, if you have controversy, we're very happy to hear them. And uh, a couple of my colleagues will lead that as we finish. But I'm going to talk to you for half an hour or so with some provocation, perhaps, for, for where this might be. Let me just uh, reduce the size of that and then I can see my own slides. There we go. So this is a, a quote about pandemics. It's an obvious place to start. The pandemic which has swept around the world has been without precedent. You can read the rest or not as you see fit. So this could have been in last week's Le Monde or last week's Guardian, uh, but it wasn't. It is the front page of the Science Journal of 1919 the last time the world faced anything remotely like this. And actually, this is different again. If, if you don't think this is a once in a lifetime, unprecedented time, you have misunderstood. This is like nothing the world has ever known. And this is the man who was in the seat when the music stopped. This is Dr. Tedros, he's the former Ethiopian health minister and he's now the Director General of the WHO. And to tell you the truth, I'm glad he was there because I think him and his organization have done an astonishing job. It's hugely difficult, 196 countries to try and corral and produce guidance for from Scotland to Botswana, from Australia to Lithuania. It's really difficult, but I think they've done a really good job. I think they've also done a very good job at communicating. They've had a number of individuals, including a, a quite robust Irishman who has been on the TV quite a lot and led quite a lot of their question and answer sessions. And that, that's where we started, but where are we? So unfortunately, the story begins badly. These are the reported numbers of COVID-19 cases and deaths across the world up until today. So we've had half a billion positive tests. This is in countries who record the testing in such a way that we can combine it and measure it together. Not everybody does that. And we've had 6.2 million people die with a COVID-19 diagnosis on their death certificate. Now, remember, death certification is a variable thing across the world and not always as reliable. It's very reliable in some countries and less reliable in others, of course. So we've done some studies. The Lancet published the, this work from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation just a couple of weeks ago. And it, the exam question was, how many people have truly died? What is the pandemic death toll? And it is 18 million. And this is estimated from uh, excess mortality around the world. Now, some of that is direct COVID harm. It is COVID kills you. Some of it, of course, is the result of what we did for COVID. And we're going to talk about that in some detail in just a moment. The actions we took as nations, as public health advisors, and as politicians around the world were not neutral acts. There was no easy path. There was no road you could take that didn't cause harm. It was a balance between harms. And unfortunately, there was no folder you could take from the wall that said, this is how you deal with a COVID-19 pandemic. That was unavailable. And it may be in the questioning we think about lessons to learn. This is where we are a couple of days ago. So this is what? This is April the 27th. So this is two days ago. Dark is bad, light is good. But remember, not everybody tests. So all of the numbers are not real. But in the countries that report their positive cases, these are the COVID-19 cases around the world two days ago. Sub-Saharan Africa, not much testing, I'm afraid. Southern Africa, pretty good testing. You can see we have a pandemic now in Australia and New Zealand. 
we have Southeast Asia, we still have Europe, and that is the Omicron variant spreading east, as if Eastern Europe didn't have enough to deal with. And you can see we have Chile, Canada, the US, the UK still in trouble. Portugal flashing a bit red. So what does it mean for you and us as leaders in this environment? So I'm going to give you some lessons that I think I have had to relearn, uh, and they may be real for you, they may not be. You've lost, what, 40 minutes of your life if they don't apply, but, uh, and you can hang up, nobody will know, it's Zoom. You can uh, put your camera off and make a cup of tea. So these are my lessons, and I'm going to do them in sequence. And they're not complete, they are inadequate, but they are what I think uh, are the beginnings of perhaps learning for the future. So, so my first lesson is to understand the problem. And I, and I think we have often misunderstood the problem. We have often presumed simplicity where actually we have complexity. And this is Edinburgh. This is the city I'm in right now, in fact, but not where I live. I live in the finest city in the world. I live in Glasgow, just 50 minutes on the train from Edinburgh. And the finest thing about Edinburgh, for those of you who don't know, is the train to Glasgow. But this is Edinburgh where all the tourists come. And this is half a mile from the castle, which is in the main shopping street in the city. So you have to give Edinburgh something. It's very historic. And this is a spring day. People have their jackets on, they're having drinks or coffees, or this is what it looks like most days in most European capitals around the continent. This is it in April, 2020. We put everybody in their houses. We shut the businesses, we shut the offices, we shut the hotels. Again, not a neutral act. So I was in the room when that decision was made. I gave advice with which to make that decision. And 194 countries in the world did that to varying degrees. Some did it very strictly. China, you can see even on an ongoing basis, some of that still happening. Some countries did it slightly more loosely. Sweden is the obvious example where it was slightly more voluntary, but the result was the same. The result was boarded up windows of pubs and comedy clubs and businesses and civil servants and others back in their houses. In Scotland, we let people leave for care, for exercise and for shopping. That was the only thing they could leave the house for. We didn't, like in France, require you to have a certificate to be able to do that. So everybody had degrees of what that was. And we did that to buy ourselves time. Nobody knew what this was. It didn't have a name. The virus didn't have a name and the disease didn't have a name. We just knew that in Northern Italy, people were dying. And we knew that had come from Wuhan in China. And we knew people were dead in the corridors outside intensive care units because the intensive care units were full. And those of us in the front of that decision-making knew that we had to very quickly treble our intensive care capacity. We had to empty our hospitals as quick as we could in order to make capacity, but also to protect those who weren't infected, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a long story and lots of public inquiries to come about whether we did that right, wrong, or a mixture of both. Now, the mission statement, though, is more complex than it may first perceive, and that's my first lesson, is that understand. If it were just to reduce deaths from coronavirus, this is a relatively straightforward infection. You just put everybody in their house, you send them food parcels and you wait for it to pass. But you can't do that because you have to also reduce the non-virus harms to the population. So in Scotland, we called that the four harms. And every country had a version of this. This just happens to be Scotland's version. So harm number one, COVID harm, death and misery from the infectious disease. Pretty easy to understand. Harm number two, what you do to your health and social care system to cope with harm one. So that's waiting times. That's the mental health increase. That's all the things we had to do to elective subject. Harm number three, the social harms, the loneliness, the fact that if you stop educating children in schools, you have to do homeschooling. And homeschooling is not universally available to children in every demographic group. In fact, some children go to school as an area of protection. And if you stop them going to school, they will come to harm. It's as simple as that. And that's the equation each of us had to find a way through. And harm number four, economic harm. Losing your job, 
losing your house, losing your business. And in Scotland, we had leads, policy leaders for each of these harms. So the chief medical officer and I and the chief nurse led harms one and harm two. We had a chief policy, social policy advisor for harm three, and we had a chief economist for harm four. So imagine the not so fictional conversations where the chief medical officer and I say, well, we think we should close the schools because the infection rate is too high. And the social policy advisor says, whoa, hold on. If you close the schools, this is what's going to happen. And the first minister of the country and the cabinet of the country, the elected leaders of the country, not me, then have to make a choice about what to do. So let me just emphasize those elements in a slightly different way. I'm going to jump past that to here to some data. So each of those harms has reams and reams of actual hard data. This is our case rate. These are our deaths. So this is mortality from COVID in Scotland in the first wave. You can see in April, May 2020 at its highest. Then our uh, Delta wave in the Christmas and New Year of 2021. And then our Omicron wave that we are presently, hopefully, on the back end of. And you can see vaccination has had an astonishing effect inside that 2021 period. But still too many people dying. And you can see the age range there. Uh, the, it's still a, a disease very clearly of the elderly because it's a disease of immunity. It is not a disease of pre-existing respiratory condition. It is a disease of immunity. And we didn't know that in March 2020 because you couldn't know that in 2020. It hadn't existed for long enough. So that's harm one. Harm two is our uh, effect on the healthcare system. So this is emergency admissions and planned admissions. Blue is now pandemic, orange is normal, let's call it. So the previous two years pre-pandemic. So you can see we still haven't recovered to our elective or emergency admission rate that we had pre-pandemic. So that is backlog. Every country in the world has it. Whether they call it that or whether they call it out is a different question, but every country in the world has that backlog. We have effectively stopped some orthopedic elective surgery and we will have to catch up. And we had got rid of that. The UK was known for its waiting times. Those of you not in the UK will know that we became a bit of a poster child for elective waiting times. Well, that had gone. We, we were seeing everybody within two or three months and we were able to treat everybody on time. Well, unfortunately, we have gone back uh, in the pandemic and we're now people are waiting considerably longer than they should on our waiting lists. Harm number three, this is school absence. This is from January 2022 to March, just the Easter break in March. Dark black is non-COVID. So that stays pretty stable throughout the year. That's colds and flus and holidays and bad kids being sent home and all of that. Blue is new. That's COVID absence. That's kids not at school because of COVID. And you can see the rate on the y-axis. That's between 4 and 5% of children not in school because of COVID. Either infection or self-isolation, the rules we set. That is social harm. You, you cannot replace that. That is a significant harm for these young people. So that's my first lesson, to understand where we are, to think about what the actual problem is. Now, let's move to lesson number two. Lesson number two is to step up. It is to lead. Now, if you don't have imposter syndrome in my seat or many seats in leadership of the pandemic, then you have misunderstood because this is how it felt. When the first minister of the country turns to you in a boardroom and says, what should we do about nightclubs? What should we do about concerts or football games? or schools, and you don't feel like Homer Simpson with this size of brain, then you have misunderstood the challenge because there, there is no uh, Google that can help you with this. There is no easy path. One of the things I've relied on is my time in Boston. So when I was in Boston, I had the privilege of not only going to the Harvard School of Public Health and uh, uh, fortunately managing an MPH, but I was also a fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Some of you may know it. It's the 
foremost organisation in the world doing change and improvement in health and care systems. And Scotland has had a partnership with them ever since those years when I went uh, a number of years ago now, nearly 15 years ago now. One of the things they have is a leadership framework. Uh, there's many, many leadership frameworks. This just happens to be one of them. But it's based on evidence. They went, they sent the medical director of the Mayo Clinic to high-performing systems around the world, Sweden, Scotland, bits of America, bits of Canada, all over the world, and worked out how individuals behaved. So you can read the white paper. It's available on IHI.org. There's also the how to be a leader and there's the organogram and what your organization should look like. But I like this bit because this is about individuals. This is about how you should behave. And that, that seems to me to be something that we could all strive to perhaps do. So behavior number one is person-centered care. Now, in my normal life, in my peacetime job, that was about clinicians and nurses and general practices and intensive care units. Well, the principle stayed the same, that stayed the same, but the clientele changed. So in Scotland, the Scottish Football Association, you can see the, the little logo on the, on the right-hand side, they engage with half a million people across Scotland. That's a tenth of my country. So they are children, they're young people, boys and girls who play the game. They're the professional teams. They're the people who cut the grass, make the pies, serve the lunches. They, they are hugely important. But if you want to get them to be vaccinated, you better engage with grassroots football. If you want to speak to young people, you should probably speak to Young Scott in Scotland, the award ceremony I'm going to go to uh, in an hour or so. So each country has a version of this. Now, whether that's HIV Scotland or Epilepsy Scotland, I, I spent a huge amount of time engaging with these populations, person-centered communication. The second behavior is frontline engagement. So you, you can't know what it is to run a retail sector or a bus company unless you visit, unless you see what it is to be in the bus company. Now, in my normal job, frontline engagement meant walking through intensive care and understanding what it was for me to be a surgeon and my pals and others. But... In this world, I had a new front line. The front line was nightclubs. The front line was supermarkets. The front line was educational establishments. And so I had to learn what that was like. And I spent a lot of time trying to be present, even during the peak of the pandemics, to try and understand what it was like to run a concert venue, to run a prison, to run a parliament, would you believe? And Because we had to work out how we were going to run the parliament with an infectious disease that was a risk to those who were in it. So behavior number two that I would commend to you is frontline engagement. You can't understand it unless you are in it. Behavior number, th oh, this is the health secretary and I on our first visit to uh, the frontline in the pandemic. So he got the health secretary job during the pandemic and that's him and I on our first, on our first hospital visit with him. He had been the justice secretary and then he was thrown in to the health secretary job in May 2021. And suddenly he has to understand this craziness that is a global pandemic. The third behavior is relentless focus. And that's the rhythm of improvement in the conventional improvement and leadership frame. But here it was about communication. So those of you who are from Scotland are fed up with me being on your radio programs. I apologize. And I'm no longer on quite so much, but even my mother, has stopped listening to me on the telly. So you don't have to listen anymore. But the marketing, the constant press conferences, that was deliberate. That was deliberate to drive the changes we needed in the populations. And this is Scotland's version. This was our facts communication that was about the behaviors that people had to try and lead. And you can see this, these are adverts and posters that we had all over the country on every poster. I, I'll never forget the day I walked through Scotland's main railway station and I saw myself on a big video screen giving the instructions to the population. It was a very surreal moment for a fairly anonymous surgeon to now be on the screen at the big railway station trying to help people to stay safe. I did get to do some interesting filming. You can see I'm beside the River Tay in uh, the north of Scotland. It was a fantastic day filming on a sunny day uniquely in Scotland. But we had 
huge advertising. We used marketing and every country in the world did, did very similar things. So that's the third behavior. The fourth behavior is transparency. We did daily press conferences for the first year of the pandemic, every day, Saturday and Sunday. We answered questions from any journalist who, who turned up. We never stopped them. We went sometimes for an hour and a half, two hours, sometimes 45 minutes. And we spoke to the people at home. Now, initially, of course, lot, hundreds of thousands of people watched and then it faded away. But, but we continued to try and drill that message home. And we told the truth as we knew it at the time. You can see in this moment, I'm not sure if I'm looking at the First Minister saying, would you stop talking and let me speak? Or she often looked at me and said, would you stop talking and let me speak? It was a bit of a fight for camera time. The other thing we did transparently was, of course, we told the truth. We, we published a lot. So even now you can go on the Public Health Scotland website, you can get the positivity rate in your street, you can find the cases, you can know what the risk is if you leave your home. And we also published the instructions and guidance for the population. And we tried to do that in a way that people could understand it. I was on a lot of phone-ins. I did a lot of uh, football shows and young people shows and BBC Radio One, would you believe? A 53-year-old white guy on the rap show on Radio One is a slightly unusual uh, booking but to try and get the message across to those who we needed to change behavior. And then the fifth behavior and final behavior is boundarylessness. It's a made up American word by IHI, but you get what it means. It illustrates it perfectly. It's about bringing all of those communities together and thinking about what that will mean and be, because you cannot deal with a global pandemic unless you involve the politicians, the transportation system, the police, the media, the third charity, the third sector is what we call our charitable sector. And the people of Scotland, you, you cannot do this unless you do the phone-in shows because you have to be able to speak to Barbara who has a particular problem with her and her husband because they're scared to leave the home or they have kids in England and they don't know whether they can bring them back to Scotland or whatever it, whatever it might be. And we, we did a great deal of that over the last two and a bit years, and many others did it too. So they, those are the five behaviours. Person-centeredness, frontline engagement, relentless focus, transparency, I nearly forgot the fourth one, and boundarylessness. Uh, and this is my illustration of all of that in together. And some of, some of the crowd who are from Scotland will recognise some of these images. I mean, you, you cannot do this if you don't involve everybody. So we had the armed forces doing vaccination. This is one of our big football clubs, one of the sides of Glasgow. They, they did vaccination. They helped us with messaging. We were on the big screens in the stadia to try and get the message across. We spoke on podcasts around the world, around the country to talk to, this happens to be a school podcast. And we had to also visit the areas that were closed. So on the bottom right is Edinburgh Airport. Edinburgh Airport was effectively shut for 18 of the 24 months of this pandemic so far, really. So we spent a lot of time in private, often, with the individuals who were trying to maintain the employment and prospects of the individuals who worked there. So those are my first two behaviours. The third behaviour you'll be delighted to know is short. So we won't spend too much time on the third behaviour. So you can get your questions typed in and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to try and answer them. If they're too hard, I might send them to Stefan, but I'm very happy to take any observations you have, particularly from around the world, if you've got something to offer. So understand the problem, lead in the problem. So step up, who else is gonna do it? Now that doesn't have to be at a country level, that might be a clinic, it might be just you and your friends, it might, it might be your family. I don't, I don't know what that is, but lead, set an example, run towards the problem, don't wait for others to do so. And then my third lesson is to breathe. We have to heal. This, this has been hard and it's been hard for many. I have a friend who works in a supermarket who runs customer service, front door customer service in a supermarket. That is hard. That is the front line of the COVID pandemic. My wife is a teacher. She was in the main out teaching. She did key worker school for a while. She's now back doing 
on the ground teaching. She teaches English as an additional language to refugees and immigrants in Scotland. So she's seen the front line of some of the real challenges. Now, Ukrainians, previous Syrians, Eritreans, others who Scotland welcome uh, with an open heart. And Lynn teaches them English and helps them with their English, although often it doesn't take much teaching. They're often better than the kids that she's used to teaching. And the health and social care workers who have seen uh, death and destruction beyond what they have ever known before. I met a young healthcare assistant who had worked in intensive in uh, infectious diseases in one of Scotland's hospitals. And she'd worked the year before the pandemic and she had seen nobody die. She hadn't seen a single death in an infectious diseases ward in a year because people don't die of infectious disease in the modern world. And then she'd seen 18 deaths a week for COVID in the first wave, 18 deaths a week. So that you cannot do that without it affecting you uh, as an individual and as a team and as a system. So what do, what do we do? How do we, how do we fix that? Well, I, I, don't, I don't have the answers. Scotland doesn't have the answers, but we have to think about it. We, we've got some things across. This is NHS England's version. Uh, and we have in Scotland, NHS Scotland's version. So it's about communicating. It's about having helplines. It's about calling it out. It's about calling what it is. It's not about free chocolate at the front door and cappuccinos when you arrive for work, although I'm happy to take them if they're available, but that, that's not what well-being is. Well-being is a computer system that works and it, the ability to go home and see your children on time and the ability to have a job that pays well and all those things that we understand. And the 1919 Science Journal understood that. It understood in that pandemic, that flu, Spanish flu pandemic, that killed so many millions across the world and transformed the world, in fact, which this pandemic will also do. That science journal says it is worthwhile to give more attention to the avoidance of unnecessary personal risks and to the promotion of better personal health. That's their version, even then, of well-being. So those are my three uh, lessons. They're early. They're not complete, and there are many, many more. You will have some, and these may not apply to you, but perhaps there's little kernels within there that might. So understand your problem, lead in the problem, and heal, breathe. Take time for yourself, for your family, for the team you lead, and make sure people can recover and talk about what they've been through. My, my, final, my final lesson is if you ever meet Doc, and Doc puts you in a DeLorean, and asks you to go back to the future, and he dials up the year on the front of the DeLorean. If you don't know the movie, Back to the Future, you should absolutely watch it. Watch it. You have missed out. It's one of the finest movies ever made. Uh, do not go back to 2020. It was mostly miserable. Thank you for listening, and I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions. S Stefan, I think I'm handing to you first, am I? Yes, thank you very much, Jason. Amazing, as always, presentation. <clears throat> thank you. Um, we see there are a few questions in the chat. Um, maybe Vicky and I will, will go through them. Um, from Lawrence, the first question is, um, as always, a great talk, Jason. Thank you. In, re in, re in retrospective, what would be the main points that you would handle differently when you look back to how the pandemic was dealt with? It's the most common question. It's always the first one. In, in, all the, in all the talks we're doing. It's very important, though, to examine the question before I give you the answer. And I'm not scared of the question, of course, but, but let's think about the question in some detail first. Since we're, since we're mostly scientists in the room, let's think about the premise. So is the question, what would you do differently if you knew then what you know now? That's one version of the question. The other version of the question is, what would you do differently knowing what you knew then? And that's really difficult because you have to put yourself in the shoes of the people who are making the choices with, of course, limited information, because every day there is limited information. And, and that's what public inquiries around the world. And Scotland is having a public inquiry. The UK is having a public inquiry. And I think the next few years of my life will probably be those public inquiries. And I, I'm very happy to tell the truth inadequately in those environments. So the simpler one to answer is 
what would I do differently if I'd known then what I know now? Well, we know 30% of people are asymptomatic. We know it's more airborne than we believed because we thought it was droplet spread. Not, not because we were blinkered, because that's what the science told us at the time. It's not that we chose to think it wasn't airborne. We thought it was droplet spread because that's what everybody had done. That was the mainstream view. It turns out it's much more airborne than we thought. And actually, as the variants have developed, it appears to have become more airborne. And that's one of the reasons why it's become more transmissible. We thought the at-risk group was heart disease, respiratory disease, the conventional comorbid, forgive the shorthand, the conventional comorbid population. It turns out that's not the most at-risk population. It turns out the most at-risk population is all about immunity. Now that might be immunity caused by age. So if you're over 75, if you're over 80, your immunity is falling, therefore you're more at risk of COVID. But it's also chemotherapy, heart transplantation, untreated HIV. It's anything that affects your immune system. We didn't know that in March, 2020, nobody did. Now, some people, this is where I get a little bit defensive, Stefan, I apologize. Some people claim they knew then and we didn't listen. That's not true. That's simply not true. Now, what we knew then, we had limited information. And I had, for example, the care home discharge work is, is the, in the UK is the, is the obvious example. And the, the care home discharge advice will stay with me for my whole life because people died because of the advice we gave and the, the product, the result of, of that event, those series of events. And that happened in a lot of countries around the world. So I would love to be able to take that back and, and not have those individuals die of COVID. Asymptomatic spread, staff, visitors, patients, residents who went to those environments. But we simply didn't know the risk because we had Italy with people dying in hospitals and we needed to get people out of where we knew the virus was coming and we knew it was gonna to come to hospitals. So we had to then take people out. The, the, there are some simpler things we could have done better. I think we could have communicated with uh, more disparate groups quicker. So I spent quite a lot of time with the gypsy traveler community, the Polish community in Scotland who are very vaccine skeptic in general, the African diaspora across Scotland because they have their own radio station. And I wish I had known that earlier on and our communication became much more rounded and much broader in, in the two years. And I, I wish I'd done some of that right at the beginning. Although you could argue that I was, a, I was an amateur communicator early on. It was probably best I didn't do some of those radio stations in the, in the beginning. That's fantastic. Thank you. Vicky, yeah, would you great. like to take the next one? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, Jason, the, the last part of your answer to the, the previous question segues very nicely into this next question um, from a Tin Min Sui. How do you engage with people on social media who are being ex exposed to disinformation about the pandemic? Do you think censorship or potentially harmful content should be imposed? I guess that would um, include people who are anti faxers um, they're disenfranchised. What a great question. Uh, so, I, so I've been at the front end of this, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, sometimes I open my mail or my private secretary opens the mail with some trepidation. We've had used masks sent to us. We've had threats. I've had the police have to look through my house and check the locks. And uh, I and my colleagues have had to have protection at some level from uh, the security services. And that is an ongoing challenge. Even today, I heard of a colleague who had had a threat from an, an anonymous source. It, that, that takes you to the darker end, so the, the real edge. And to, to be frank, Victoria, the, the very, Vicky or Victoria, the, the edge should be ignored. The, the way to deal with the very, very edge is to allow the security services to deal with them. So you should not engage. You should not respond. You shouldn't answer them on social media. You should just ignore them. And if they become threatening, or if you feel threatened in any way, you should report them to somebody who can help you with that. Uh, and you should do that within your workplace, but you should also do it within your security services. And most universities, most health systems, 
most governments would have an available way of doing that. We have a network of doing that in Scotland that's available to me and to others. The politicians get it, of course, much, much worse than me. It's really horrific. The more interesting thing is what you should do with the next group. And the next group are the skeptics, those who have questions, those who are perhaps engaging in that vaccine uh, theory, the, the real conspiracy theory. They, you should engage with. And you should engage with them with an open mind, with evidence, with intellect, but you should also do it in a way that meets them where they are. And what I mean by that is the 53-year-old white guy is not the guy to speak to the teenagers of Scotland. Much as I would think I'm the fantastic communicator for the teenagers in Scotland, my TikTok profile is probably not up to scratch. So I can engage with the leaders of that teenage community, and that's what we do with Young Scott. They have a health committee. They have about 15 young people who have put their hands up, a very diverse group, some disabled, lots of ethnicities, who have put their hands up to say, we will help with health and care. I speak to them, we share the science, we talk about it, they then share with the young people of Scotland. And I've got stories of that within the gypsy traveler community, within the African immigrant community, with whatever it might be. So that's the way you deal with that next group and you bombard them, I, that's probably the wrong expression, with the true advice, with the evidence and advice that is science. And eventually, you, that works, that breaks through. There's then, a, there's then a third group, and it, in summary, they're lazy. They're just lazy. So they, they don't come for vaccination or they don't come for testing because they just can't be bothered. They don't think it's about them. The disease feels disparate. The disease feels a long way away. The way to deal with them is make it easy. So make the system straightforward. So if they're in a college, take the testing unit into the front door of the college. If, if you've got a vaccine caravan, park it outside the student accommodation so they can't avoid passing you and make sure you've got a very robust nurse who shouts at them as they walk past and make sure they're vaccinated. So, so you need tactics for different groups, Vicky. And I, I, I think at one end, the, the questioner says, do we need censorship? Yes, if, if, it's, if it's true conspiracy theory, then yes. But, but that shouldn't be the mainstream job. The mainstream job should be trying to tackle that bigger group who are skeptic with evidence, with, with trying to get across the truth. I, I did some vaccine clinics in Scotland. Uh, I, I was a vaccinator. And uh, I, I met a Colombian couple who happened to be in Glasgow, a mum who had come for vaccine. And she had a teenage daughter who came with her to translate into Spanish because my Spanish is dreadful. And uh, the young lady did all the, all the translation for her mum and her mum got her vaccine and it was all going very well. And having heard the evidence that I had discussed with the mum, the 14 year old then said, as she was leaving, could I have my vaccine? I said, of, of course you can have, of course you can have your vaccine. So when you get to meet people and look them in the eye and you get to describe the evidence, often it's an easier conversation than you were expecting. Very powerful, suddenly makes us more optimistic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, another question from Haruhiko Matsuda. Um, thank you very much for the amazing presentation. Did you face any challenges with medical or I presume also wider healthcare professionals during COVID? In some countries, I understand medical professionals had signed up to save other people's lives and had very high commitment in doing so but not everyone was ready to risk their own lives necessarily in doing so. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. That's not something we've, we've had a challenge with, although I imagine there are pieces of the puzzle that have been like that. We, we have been enormously grateful for our health and social care staff. So we have lost health and social care staff across the UK. Health and social care staff have died, particularly in the early stages, pre-vaccination, pre-therapeutics where this disease, they caught this disease professionally and they, and they died, or members of their family died completely tragically. Now, that, that's not happening. We, we know how to avoid this disease much more and we have uh, very good vaccines and very good therapeutics. But we haven't come across an unwillingness to step up. If anything, we've had the opposite. We've had people willing to commit and almost kill themselves, forgive the expression, 
by stepping up. And, and I worry that people have given too much and, and, and people have committed to longer days and longer hours than perhaps they should have. So I, I haven't come across that. I think in other parts of the world, that's probably true. And that will be partly about education, partly about support services. I, I've now, I've spent a bit of time in the last few weeks going around Scotland, trying to uh, visit the health systems that we have in Scotland to thank them and visit them and uh, be annoying and be patronizing to thank them all for the work they've done. And I, I've met nothing but people who are both tired and, and uh, done, but also stories of, of great joy and, and great work throughout the system. Fabulous, thank you. Right, the next question is also from um, Haruhiko. Um, how would you describe how prepared Scotland is for the next unknown pandemic? I guess it's a big, big topic, you know, um, pandemic preparedness, um, both uh, Stefan Bansell, who's the CEO of Moderna, and uh, Kate Bingham, who headed the vaccine task force, lamented that, you know, governments in general are just not prepared. They, they invest in um, armed forces and all that, but just not the next, you know, um, likeliest um, risk that's going to hit us. Yep. I don't, I don't think that's entirely fair. I think there's some truth in it, of course. We, we weren't as ready as we should have been, and nobody was. And it, pretty much every risk register in every government in the world had a flu pandemic as number one. If you looked at the health risk assessment, it was probably flu pandemic, antimicrobial resistance. They were the two big global challenges. Nobody predicted a coronavirus pandemic. There are a couple of people who now say they predicted a coronavirus pandemic, but I, I refer you to my previous answer. So what, what's next? It, it is unknown, and we are more ready than we were. But let's remember, these are not common events. We're still halfway through this one. We're pro the WHO think we're maybe two or three years into a five-year process. So we're not done. Haiti has vaccinated 2% of its population. Ethiopia has vaccinated 2.5% of its population. We've vaccinated, for every 100 people, we've given 250 vaccines. So we've vaccinated everybody two and a half times. Haiti has vaccinated 1% of its population once. So, so we're, we're, not, we're not done with this one. The, the, most, the most likely scenario is a flu pandemic. Still, that's still the most likely scenario, even though we had a coronavirus pandemic. We will be more ready. We, will, we are setting up in Scotland a standing committee on pandemics. But if there's no pandemic for 50 years, we will not be ready again, of, of course, because that's, that's the human condition. That, that's what you do. Of course, we'll have a storage of PPE. We will have the ability to talk to the vaccine companies. We will, but the, the direction will move. Already, you can see the global media moving to different stories. Diff quite rightly, the, the horror in Eastern Europe is exactly where the media and the global attention should be. But we, we have to, as healthcare professionals, try and prepare both the public and our infrastructure for what that will be. But that's a global problem that, that the School of Public Health and the schools of public health around the world have to grasp. Because one of, one of, the, one of the interesting things is where, where I've been in this job is where theory meets practice. It is all very well saying that the global pandemic preparedness wasn't X, Y, or Z. So what's your plan? What, what is your actual plan? And are you willing to step into the governments or the European Commission or the African Union or whatever it is that would do that for you and be the leader who does that preparation? Because that's real public health. That's not theoretical. That's actually preparing a country and a population for whatever comes next. And that's what we've tried to do in Scotland. Excellent, thank you. Um, a question if, um, if um, I might ask as well. Um, they say politicians decide, advisors advise. How do you deal or how did you deal and manage with different politicians, sometimes from different parties, sometimes having different views? Um, how did you deal with that? Yeah, so very early on in my uh, bureaucratic career, if you can call it that, Stefan, I, 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 uh, I had a moment with, with the now First Minister of Scotland, but she was then the Health Secretary of Scotland, 
and uh, the Scottish National Party, who are the governing party in Scotland just now, for those of you who don't know, she was the health secretary. She won uh, in 2007 and became the health secretary. And I was in pitching. It was I just started in government and I was in pitching about quality and safety. And we were going to do this wonderful thing and we were going to save the world and all this nonsense. And uh, uh, she said, she said, OK, let, let's let's do it. Let's let's do that program of work. And I need you to tell me every day how you're getting on. And I said, no, 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 it'll take 10 years, Minister. This is, this. and the civil servant who'd been there forever was c pulling me by the collar and escorting me out of the room to try to stop me talking. And uh, he taught me a very important lesson uh, over a series of years that I've still not fully learned. That the job of a senior advisor in a democracy, like me, nobody elected me, nobody voted for me, thank heavens. The, the job of the job of my and my position and those like me, uh, like Chris Whitty in England and those in France and Germany who did the same jobs, is to give the best advice you can, genuflect and leave. That's your job. Now, the genuflection is optional, but the, give the best advice you can, genuflect and leave. Now, it's not quite as simple as that, of course, because you inevitably form relationships with these people. They're human beings. So I spent every day for months with the First Minister of Scotland. So inevitably you make a cup of tea or you, you, have, you have a shared experience. You, of, of course you do. But there is a clear separation in, in uh, elected democracies. There is a very clear separation between those who are elected to make the choices and those who advise. And if you can't do that, if you don't have that pragmatism switch, in your head, you cannot be a government advisor. It is impossible. Now, everybody has a line. There would be a moment when I would say, well, I'm done. If they don't take this advice, I'm done. And, and everybody has that line. I, I, I don't know where mine is. Chris Whitty doesn't know where his is, but you'll know it if you see it. And, and there will be times when advisors have to step back and not, not do it anymore. And you can see that's happened in some countries. People have, people have thought, okay, if that's your decision, that's your choice but I'm no longer going to be your advisor. I've never reached that point uh, in, in the Scottish government. I've always been very well listened to. I have felt heard. And uh, as I described the four harms, one of the things I've had to learn, of course, is that in that room, sitting beside me, is a guy called Gary Gillespie, who is not a public figure, who's the chief economist. And he brings a different lens and a different set of advice to the First Minister of Scotland. And she has to choose, not between our advice, it's not as simple, it's, it's not binary, but inside that advice, we have to find the way through that is the best for the people of Scotland. And she gets to choose that with her elected cabinet. So I actually find it quite refreshing that I can say on the radio. So if I'm on Radio 4 and they ask me a question about the decision making, I can say, well, I didn't, I didn't decide. I, it's not my choice. I, I gave the best advice I could at the time with the evidence and the knowledge I had, along with my colleagues, I had this thing behind me that's called the Joint Committee on Vaccination. They provide the evidence. We portray that evidence. We give it to the leaders of our country. They choose. If you want to argue about the decision making, have them on your program. So, so I think that's I think that's the way a functioning democracy should be, Stefan. Uh, no, nobody has found a better. It's inadequate, but nobody, as far as I can tell, has found a better way of running a country. Thank you so much. I'm looking also at the time. I think we have one more quick question. Time for one very quick one. Vicky, please. Yes, um, I'm looking at uh, Stephen Sharma's. Um, well, actually, it's an observation, at least a question, though. So thank you very much for speaking with your with vulnerability and honesty about the qualities that leaders need to have during this unique pandemic. Um, there's a delicate balance between doing the right thing regarding protecting the health of our people and protecting the economy. So um, the follow-up question would be, how would you find that balance or how would you advise the leader to find that balance? Yeah, I think that's a very, very good question. And it has changed over time, hasn't it? Because right at the beginning, on March the 23rd, when 2020, when Scotland locked down, locked down in inverted commas, it, we didn't know how long that was gonna last. It was a relatively straightforward decision, actually in that moment, because we thought it would be short. We didn't think we'd be two years. We thought we would be able to 
maybe eradicate, maybe eliminate, maybe suppress. We knew we had to do it because otherwise our health service was going to be completely overwhelmed and we were going to have people dying inside our intensive care units waiting for beds. So that was quite straightforward. Then quite quickly, it got much more complex because it went on. And that meant the, ho the hotels were closed, the tourism stopped, the transportation stopped, and the UK government then brought in, like many countries, brought in a furlough scheme, a, a funding of salary scheme. I mean, unprecedented in the modern age that we would give people 80% of their wages from government. And that, that's what kept the economy alive and allowed the public health advisors to continue to give the advice we gave. But that balance and conversation has been constant throughout the pandemic. And even now in April, 2022, when we are in Scotland, at least, coming out of the Omicron wave and the world is kind of getting back to normal, everything is open. So I'm about to go to an in-person award ceremony for the first time in two and a half years. We've got schools open, we've got hospitality open. So the economy is bouncing back, but some restaurants are still closed and some shops have never reopened. So it's a constant challenge. And the, the metrics around, so I can very clearly show how many people die of COVID. The economic harm in a health sense is much, much more difficult to articulate. And schools of public health are part of our response and examination of that question. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, I'm looking at the clock and I think we'll bring it to a close. We've got quite a few more questions, but we are grateful for your time. And uh, we hope uh, now that you uh, see us, you will join us again soon at other events as well. Um, I will just open here my uh, text and to thank you again for a most inspiring presentation. It was a great privilege to listen to your reflections on, on leadership over these last two challenging years and beyond. Harvard Club UK and the Special Interest Group in Healthcare always welcomes collaborative events between alumni groups from different Harvard schools. Many thanks to the support of Harvard Alumni in Healthcare. Thank you to Jason once again for representing the School of Public Health. Many thanks to my co-host Victoria Long from Harvard Club UK, Dr. David Rogers, Marielle Baudreau from the Office for Alumni Affairs of Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health. And to you all, our members and our guests, thank you for coming and we look forward to the next time. Thank you.